I still remember the morning when I heard about the coup. It was just like an ordinary morning, and then I locked my phone to check my social. But I couldn't load any news because there was no internet. And then I heard like my brother scream. So my brothers like screaming. They took over the country. They are announcing it on TV. It's been two years since the military in Myanmar seized power, deposing the elected government of the National League for Democracy in a coup. Attention on the country has faded in the global consciousness, but its youth are still hopeful, trying to keep the spirit of a revolution alive. A 30-year-old Myanmarese man who wanted to be known as Loki tells us about the current situation in Myanmar two years after the coup. Let's go back to the February 2021. To be honest, like in the first few weeks of uh, protesting, we were kind of like even excited because there are like so many people on the streets. We never know what would happen next. There were no casualty yet. People were hopeful, you know. The world was watching, and we made headlines in major news channels. Every evening at 8 p.m., we bang pots and pans, you know, which is like a traditional belief when people try to drive away the evil spirits. It usually lasts for like 50 minutes and it ends with people chanting revolutionary anthem. When everyone was so active, uh, there was a tiny thought at the back of my mind that said like, what if it's all gone one day? You know, one day when no one goes out on the street, not a single sound. No one dared to show the defiance, you know? And that day actually came. Fast forward two years later, uh, we have thousands of people killed, houses burned down, villages like rampaged, the crowds on the street has vanished. This is Toru Kubota, a Japanese documentary filmmaker who was imprisoned in Myanmar in July last year for being involved with a protest. They cannot openly do the protest anymore, so what they do is called flash protest. And they get it on the spot, and they only can do the protest for a very short time, like a minute. They just run away after that. Toru said he did not initially plan to film the protest, but was unsettled by what he saw in the country. The city was quiet, and that was weird. So I felt that the violence was lurking in the shadows. That kind of feeling made me think that I needed to cover the demonstration and protests because they could barely get the chance to express their opinions. The current generation of Myanmar's youth grew up with access to online information thanks to a brief decade of opening. And when the coup happened, they found the need to make their voices louder than ever. We've also seen this voice, I think, and role of uh, the, the younger generations, particularly Gen Z, really voicing out um, what they view as their future uh, being cut short, being disrupted, being interrupted uh, by military rule. I admire the younger people who are still doing this because this is a way to show defiance. We may be kept silent, but we still raise our voice in our own ways. As the revolution continues, you know, the protests, especially in the urban city, it's become very difficult for the young people to do the protests. But they continue to do so anyway, but at their security risks. And they are like sniffing around, you know, to see where are the young people living together. And they do the night raids like very, very frequently. There's a high price that these young protesters have to pay should they be caught. And I met the 17 year old political prisoner, and he had been in that detention cell for a year already. He was taken to the, the prison after that. So the detention cell was, it was a terrible place. It was horrible. More than 20 people were squeezed into the room which was like two meters times five meters square space including a toilet hole and uh, it was extremely unhygienic but being detained is not the only consequence these young protesters are facing what happened to some supporters or fighters was you know when the gender know your family knows your family place they will come and find you and if you're not there they detain one of your parents so this is a very cunning but effective way of making people kill them. Everyone is like a, you know, like a chicken out of a basket. They can just grab and just squeeze their neck. So why are the young people still protesting despite the dangerous consequences? I think this is a, a chance to give back to our future generation because obviously our parents or you know the older generation they have failed us and we cannot fail our future generation again. But is it true that only the young people are participating in the protest? The 2021 coup, it has also, I think, helped to bridge generations 
uh, across the different decades because you know um, the older generations who have been through previous coups um, I don't think they want to relive decades of darkness again so there will be different ways of how they come across, come out and support it. But why is the military ruling the country with such a firm grip and cracking down so hard on its people? For that, I think we need to also look back into the country's political history. Military rule runs deep in Myanmar politics. The military formed political parties even before the country's independence. Political instability involving communist rebellions and minority revolts after independence created the perfect opportunity for the military to have a larger role in the country. In 1958, the military was invited to be a caretaker of the country to restore stability. They were supposed to hand power back to a political party that received a majority vote in elections. But in 1962, the military seized power to preserve their control and impose decades of socialist rule. With uh, that notion of ensuring stability, that narrative has become very much a part of how the military views its um, its political role. So the military sees itself as the defender of the state and of course any unrest will be viewed as a disruption of the peace that needs to be contained. But that's not how military action is being viewed internationally. The United Nations condemned the coup and has demanded the military to stop their actions. I think uh, how the broader international community views the Myanmar crisis would be mainly that Myanmar is in Southeast Asia there's a regional organization in Southeast Asia that is uh, you know, a collective representative of, uh, of uh, regional matters and regional affairs. And therefore, uh, the entity, the organization that has the competence to uh, deal with um, a crisis happening in this region of Southeast Asia is ASEAN, the Association of Southeast Asian Nations, of which Myanmar has been a member since 1997. Ever since the coup, ASEAN has been urging Myanmar to stop military control in a non-violent way, particularly by coming up with the five-point consensus in April 2021. What has happened, of course, is uh, we saw how the State Administration Council did its own interpretation of the five-point consensus. The five-point consensus principles were, were either being ignored, interpreted, or just uh, maybe uh, manipulated altogether. A year on, ASEAN's review on the five-point consensus was that little progress was achieved in its implementation. International response currently appears to be ineffective, and with waning media attention, it's easy to put the current situation in Myanmar at the back of our heads. Why should the international community care about the situation? Because they are, they are crimes against humanity, and the people in Myanmar are crying for help. You know, I think it's fair to say that news on Myanmar is overshadowed by the news on the Ukraine and the others. Uh, but I believe that Myanmar people need much stronger support as much as Ukraine got from the international community. There's no overnight solution, there's no silver bullet. But, you know, we can't give up on a country because, uh, because things are difficult. Uh, because we can't see, we can't watch at a country imploding. It has serious consequences, cross-border consequences. And I think it's in no one's interest um, uh, to, to let a country implode. I think we are right in the history, you know. Maybe we, we are in the middle of something that would be included in the textbook of history in years to come. So I, I, I'm glad that, you know, I'm just playing the tiny part in this whole process. I think uh, for me, like revolution is not just like a snatch of a finger, you know, it doesn't happen overnight or over a year or over, over 10 years. So it's a process, it's a very painfully long process. So I'm not sure how long it's going to take for us to really see the change. But uh, to this day, I'm still holding on and many people in my country are holding on. I'm, I never use the word hope because you know people can say are you hopeful i'm like hope is a very dangerous thing you know you can hope for something to happen and if 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 it doesn't you know it can kill you so i'm not hopeful i'm just doing what i can and i will do what i can so we will you know it, it could be baby step or infant step or whatever we are taking our step-by-step -step approach 
towards the future that we want to see in the country.